So thank you so much for joining us tonight or today on Ethical Frontiers in Biotechnology. This is a multi-lecture series that I've developed at Harvard Medical School through the Center for Bioethics. And um, tonight we're going to talk about what are called multicellular engineered living systems or M-cells for short. Um, uh, so this is a series that's meant to bring both ethicists and scientists together to talk about emerging ethical issues and emerging biotechnologies. Um, tonight, I'm honored to have my co-host, Dr. Roger Cam from MIT. But let me just introduce myself in case you don't know me. My name is Insu Hyun, and I'm a professor of bioethics and philosophy at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. I'm also on the teaching faculty at the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School, and I'm a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School as well. Uh, let me turn it over now to Roger. Roger can just introduce himself briefly, and then we'll get into our program. Roger? Great, thanks, Insu. Uh, let's see. Do I want to share? I'll share my screen uh, for a second. Uh, no, I, you, you can just speak right now. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm Roger Cam from MIT. I'm in the um, um, biological engineering and mechanical engineering departments, and. Um, uh, my, I'm also the director of an NSF supported center on emergent behaviors of integrated cellular systems, which is kind of the, out, the, um, the, the parent of what I'm going to be talking about today, which is on multicellular engineered living systems. So my background is as a mechanical engineer in fluid mechanics initially, and um, I, I helped uh, organize the biological engineering department at MIT and have been a member of both the biological engineering department and mechanical engineering uh, for the past 20 years. And I uh, have known Insu for uh, several years now and very much enjoyed working with him. So I'm looking forward to the presentations today. Thank you, Roger. Okay, so let's get into our program um, brought to you by Zoom. And uh, normally we have this at a lecture hall or a, a lecture room at Harvard Medical School, but now because of our current situation, obviously, we're going to present this to you through Zoom, which allows us to actually reach a much bigger audience beyond the Harvard Medical School immediate vicinity. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and I will, uh, my slides, and I will um, go ahead and launch into the program. Okay. All right, so as I said, this series is called Ethical Frontiers in Biotechnology. And tonight, we're going to be talking about multicellular engineered living systems. That's quite a mouthful, so we're going to just call them M-cells for short. Um, these are really pretty interesting and, and, and new uh, entities. And often when uh, one is confronted with this, one may wonder, uh, what is it exactly that's in the dish? Uh, the schedule for today is to first talk about uh, what are these multicellular engineered living systems. And Roger will start us off with that, with some of the science behind this. Then we'll switch over to me and I'll introduce the concept of bioengineering ethics and why that may be useful and relevant for this field. We're going to switch back to Roger and Roger's going to talk about some current examples and the future potential of M cells. And then I'll bring us down the home stretch with talking about how we should promote the socially responsible development and application of M cells. And of course, then after that, we will spend quite a bit of time fielding your questions through the chat function. So as we're speaking along the way in our presentation, if questions come to mind, please uh, enter that into the chat function field and send that along. Um, and then at the end, we'll try to cover as many of these as we can. Okay, so I think with that, um, I'm going to turn it right back to Roger and Roger can then take over uh, with bullet point number one. Stop my share. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay. So um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today are um, what are called microphysiological systems. And, and these are systems that mimic certain aspects of physiology or biology, typically on a microfluidic platform. And I know some of you may not be familiar with, with, with uh, microfluidics in general, but 
The concept is really very simple. Uh, we use a device, something like this, that's sketched over here, where we can insert in, in the pink region here, cells that um, are suspended in, for example, a three-dimensional three matrix. So for example, uh, in the image on the right, I've suspended endothelial cells in combination with uh, fibroblast cells into a matrix. And then we have access to lateral channels that we can use to either control the environment of those cells, uh, feed them, uh, produce flows, produce concentration gradients, and, re and recapitulate a lot of the types of um, uh, the type of experience that the cells have when they're in the body in vivo. Um, and one example, I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot about um, emergent behaviors and how cells intrinsically have the capability of forming into um, three-dimensional structures. And an example that I like to use to, to demonstrate this is on the right-hand side here. These are the cells that have just been suspended in the matrix. And on the next slide, I'm going to go to a full screen view where you can see what these cells do over a 24 hour time lapse period. And what you see is that the cells, because these are endothelial cells, they want to form vascular networks. And the vascular networks are formed by the cells not so much migrating, but they actually send out projections toward their neighbors. And by the end of this 24 hour period, those vessels have actually started to form. Um, in another Four days after this time, those vessels are perfusable, and we can then start to perfuse things like organs or look at for um, uh, situations such as metastatic cancers that uh, we've, we've done a lot of work on in our lab. Um, one, as we start to make these systems more and more realistic physiologically, one of the things that we've been doing is to try to mimic the, the microvasculature that you have in different organs. And here what you see is uh, some work that we've done in taking um, three different cell types from the brain to look to see whether we can uh, reproduce the types of behavior that you see uh, it, with the microvasculature in the brain. And the reason we're interested in that are, uh, there's several. One is that uh, we'd like to be able to uh, understand better how things like drugs get from the vasculature into the brain tissues for treating diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, various other uh, uh, cancers, brain cancers, and different neurological diseases. Um, but also just as a general uh, physiological model to better understand um, how the brain ultimately works. This model currently doesn't have neurons, but one of the things we can easily do is now to start to use these vascular networks to perfuse clusters of neurons um, so that these neurons can actually survive longer time. So here what we do is we take these three different cell types, uh, astrocytes, uh, pericytes, which tend to wrap around the vessels, and then the endothelial cells that form the vessels themselves. We inject them into the central gel region in, inside a matrix. And then over a period of about four to seven days, they form uh, what you see here. The, the green cells are the endothelial cells that are forming the vascular network that we can perfuse through. We perfuse media through them. And the pink cells are astrocytes, which are taking on a conformation of morphology that's very similar to what you see in the brain. If we were to compare this image to an actual image in, in say, uh, a human brain, for example, we find that they, they appear very similar in terms of dimensions and density and so forth. We also look a lot at the functionality of these networks. So one of the things we measure is how leaky these vessels are. And a measure of that leakiness is the permeability, uh, which I'm plotting over here on the right-hand side. And here, what, what, what I show is that due to the interactions between the different cells, as we go from, first of all, just the vascular cells themselves, the endothelial cells, uh, all these cells, by the way, are human derived. These are IPS derived endothelial cells. They, they're fairly leaky initially and the networks, I don't have a picture of them here, that, but they don't look like brain microvasculature. But as we start to add the other cell types that are uh, present in the brain, here we've added the pericytes and here we've added the pericytes and the astrocytes. The functionality in terms of the permeability of these vessels gets better and better. So, uh, and at 
when we had the triculture with the pericytes and astrocytes combined with the endothelial cells, we actually get down to permeabilities that are pretty comparable to what you see, for example, in measurements in, in animals, in this case, in the rat brain. Um, you can also see that these vessels become um, more brain-like. So the vessels that I'm, that I'm forming are from um, IPS epithelial cells. And of course, IPS cells don't know, I mean, they're, they're obtained from the skin, for example. Um, they don't know anything about the brain, but when they're co-cultured with the brain cells, in this case, either the, the pericytes or the pericytes and astrocytes, they start to take on a phenotype that is characteristic of, of what you see in the brain. So for example, the, these first three rows correspond to tight junction proteins. And the, you, and the tight junction proteins tend to be more highly expressed in the endothelial cells in the brain and microvasculature in the brain. And here you can see that happening through the immunohistochemistry images that I show, uh, three different junctional proteins. Um, another thing that happens is the basement membrane tends to be better developed in, these, in, in, in the brain relative to other organs. And here you can see that through staining for laminin and uh, collagen type four. Um, those are sort of qualitative measures, but here we can do RT-PCR. So if you look at day seven with co-culture, for example, you can see as you go from uh, ips drive endothelial cells to the co-culture and the triculture, again, these three junctional proteins that I've indicated here in green, they all get upregulated relative to the co-culture, the monoculture system. Uh, as do a number of these other things that these proteins that I've ind indicated with the red arrows, these are transporter proteins that also tend to be upregulated in the brain. And, and again, we see that in the triculture system, because of the signaling between the cells, these are also uh, upregulated. I'm going to switch to a different system here. Here's, here's a model that we developed. Uh, it's a three-dimensional model. Uh, in the sense that it replicates the three-dimensional geometry and morphology in the brain of a motor unit. Uh, and we're using this to, to develop a model for, uh, for ALS so that we can use it as a drug screening platform for ALS. And, and here, it's a somewhat more complicated system than I showed you before, but really what, all that we do is we insert into one chamber um, muscle cells these muscle cells over time form a muscle strip that are that's suspended between two posts. And the reason the posts are there is so that we can measure the forces that are generated. And then at a later time point, separately, we're differentiating um, ES cells, embryonic stem cells, into motor neurons in a motor neuron neurosphere, the spherical collection of cells that we inject over here in matrix. And then over the next several days, these neurites extend out from the neurons, connect up with the muscle, and form a complete neuromuscular junction like you see here. And this is what it looks like in reality. Again, this is, these are uh, uh, fluorescently stained cells, but you can see the cell PI over here, the motor neurons that are derived from either uh, induced pluripotent stem cells or ES cells. And then also the, um, the muscle strip over on the right hand side. Um, and I, I just realized that I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself. Um, what I wanted to do here is also go back and say a little bit more general about what M cells are, because I, I realize that uh, this audience probably is not very familiar with that. So let me come back to that. But in the meantime, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the multicellular engineered living systems that uh, N. Sue was talking about. These are simply systems that are formed from multiple cell types that we can drive, for example, like you're seeing from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, here, for example, are, are muscle cells, myocytes, neurons, and endothelial cells. And with M cells, we're, doing, we're engineering these systems to produce either a functionality, functionality that already exists in vivo or one that doesn't. Maybe, and by that, I mean sort of a non-natural organ function. But we can assemble these in some way to, to, to produce a system that may have sensors, may process information uh, from the sensors, 
and then may have some sort of effectors. So these could be muscle cells, uh, they could be cells that secrete something. Um, and what we've been doing through our uh, NSF supported center is to try to develop a quantitative understanding of these multicellular living systems um, that have some sort of defined and, and pre prescribed form and function. And we've argued that we really have to establish a, a, a more fundamental understanding of these cell cell or cell matrix interactions. Um, and then be able to control those through biochemical, genetic, electrical, mechanical cues uh, in order to promote their emergent behavior to produce a complex cellular system of, of our design. So there, there's been a lot, of a lot of developments in the last 10 years, I'd say, uh, that are, are relevant to what I'm talking about tonight. One is obviously the success of iPS cells to be um, uh, that you can differentiate into a variety of different somatic cell types. Uh, and that work started uh, really by Yamanaka back in 2006. Um, you saw, you may have seen the presentation uh, from um, Jinping Fu uh, or uh, Paula Arlata. Right? I guess she's coming up next actually as a speaker. But a lot of work has been done in developing these organoid structures. These date, date back to about 2013. Um, 2011, where uh, both liver and optic pup were developed. And then later, there are organoids now for a number of different organs, and especially uh, a lot of interest has been focused on these organoids for brain. I'll, I'll come back to that just a little bit at the end. The other development is that uh, people have developed these what are called organ-on-chip models, uh, where by engineering cells and by putting them within either some sort of a structure or even taking organoids and start starting to um, develop those into organ on chip models. We can now have um, brain, lung, bone, tumor, other organ-like systems that either can operate individually or can even be interconnected. And there have been, been, there's been a lot of work uh, recently supported by DARPA to actually put 10 different organs on a single platform that can interact with each other and therefore um, uh, start to replicate some of what happens in human physiology through interacting organs. So the organoids are, I guess, what I would call the most um, emergent structures that we have. Um, the sort of an intermediate, another area of, of interest for us in M cells are what are called the microphysiological systems that I, that I mentioned. These are based on microfluidic platforms, different cell types, different matrices. These are largely engineered systems. Uh, and then biomachines is another area of interest in, um, in our NSF center. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about those tonight, but uh, these are really autonomous machines. Uh, they're not in a microfluidic device uh, and their form is really engineered and imposed by that structure. And the emergence comes about here in the context of how these cells interact to produce a, a machine-like action. So in terms of designing and fabricating M cells, you could think of different approaches. Um, in one approach, Actually, in both approaches, we start with uh, having to have some sort of a design in mind. And then we think about, based on that design, if this is, say, a pump or a sphincter or a valve of some sort, what cells need to be used in order to generate this? So as an engineer, as a mechanical engineer, I might think more of a, a, along the lines of a top-down engineering approach. First of all, differentiate the cells into neurons, muscle, and, and, and endothelial cells. Uh, then I might form the structures, the muscle strips, the vessels, the clusters of neurons. And then I'd put these together in order to make the ultimate design. That in, in, in this case, you know, like I was saying, maybe a neuron-driven set of muscles that could be used uh, as a pump in the body. Uh, and that's what I, we call the top-down engineering approach. The alternative is, is more what we would like to call an, an emergent engineering approach where we start with the same design, we still have to use ultimately get the same cells, but here rather than going through kind of the engineering assembly process, we let the cells do the self-assembly. 
So we might start with a cluster of pluripotent cells, uh, co-differentiate those through various mechanisms that I'll show on the next slide, um, so that we get the endothelial cells, the muscle cells, and the neurons, and, that in, and then induce them to self-organize into ultimately the same structure. Realistically, what we do today is kind of a mix between these two. We use some top-down engineering approaches, and then uh, certainly the emergent properties of themselves take, take place to help us form these machines. But we've been, what we've been working on in our NSF center is to try to understand this process and allow us to be able to do and go through an entirely emergent engineering approach. Um, one of the, the important steps in that process is here to uh, take these cells in cell clusters and then start to differentiate them into the different cell types in a spatiotemporal manner. So we might use biochemical factors to generate uh, neurons over here, or we can use light activation by optogenetics of, of different signaling pathways in the cells um, to induce certain cells to, to uh, become uh, endothelial cells, for example. You can use electrical stimulation, mechanical force, a number of different methods that we might use in this emergent engineering approach. And then finally, once we understand these processes better, uh, ultimately we'd like to use these to generate systems that, that have useful applications. So we have to think about how these M cells would be manufactured. And I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but they're pretty much the same processes that one thinks about uh, as a design engineer or a manufacturing engineer. How do you go from say the raw, raw materials uh, setting up design, starting to develop different um, fabrication methods. Uh, bioprinting, for example, has been very uh, instrumental in, in terms of enabling us to start to produce these living structures. Uh, and then we have the manufactured product. And then, of course, if that's going to be uh, marketed and, and used uh, for drug screening, for example, or other applications, there have to be a number of approvals and assessments uh, and other processes that we have to go through. So again, just the concept of emergence, which, which sometimes a little bit foreign to people. I'd like to give this example of the MIT cheetah, where uh, there's no emergence at all, it's completely self-assembled uh, by the, 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 the engineer, non-biological, no emergence, and it follows pretty well-established principles. Uh, the motor unit that I was starting to show you a few minutes ago, uh, certainly, we have to form the, the, the motor neurosphere, we form the muscle, there's some assembly required, but the emergence between the individual cells is really critical here. And we don't understand this well enough to be able to predict the performance very well. And then if we go to something like the brain organoid, where everything is self-assembled, emergence is everything, uh, we, can't we can't really control how the structure forms, and we can't predict its performance very well. So that sort of covers the full spectrum. So at this point, that's kind of an introduction to M cells. I'll come back to give, um, talk about the examples some more in a little bit, but now I'm gonna turn things over to Insu. Thank you, Roger. Um, so if you stop sharing your screen, I'll get mine. Thank you. Okay. So, Roger did a wonderful job giving you an introduction to what M cells are and what we mean by M cells. What I find fascinating about them from a bioethics and ethical point of view, philosophical point of view, is the very idea that you can engineer constructs that are multicellular, mammalian cells, human cells, and that you can try to design them in a way to leverage their immersion properties, as Roger just briefly explained, leverage those emergent biological properties for engineering goals and ends and purposes. So really define human tool-like purposes. Now, when I think about uh, the ethics of this emerging, very exciting area of work, I think it would be helpful to try to approach it from a new angle. In the past, we've had traditionally bioethics and engineering ethics. Um, I think that we need something in between those two something that I'm gonna call bioengineering ethics. Because traditional bioethics um, has 
plenty of tools to address ethical issues in uh, research, but they typically are uh, shaped and developed for the context of human subjects research or drug development. Um, research on entities that are natural kinds, right? So animals, human beings, genomes, things that you find in the furniture of the world, things that you find in nature itself. But what Roger has shown us is that there's plenty of interest in creating things that are non-natural kinds, things that do not on their own appear in nature, but need a nudge. They need a designer. They need an engineer to come into existence. Now, engineering ethics traditionally conceived didn't bother itself much with uh, living matter, with cells, with stem cells, with multicellular systems. Engineering ethics normally bothered itself with um, things that are completely, like the MIT cheetah, completely engineered uh, from non-living matter, steel, wires, computer chips. So we need something in between that to deal with this new space. It's gonna lie somewhere in between traditional biomedical ethics and engineering ethics. So how do we carve out this space? And this is an area of active interest of mine. It's an area that uh, um, I think deserves further exploration. And I think it's definitely a growth area in bioethics for uh, people up and coming who need a career. What distinguishes this from many other traditional forms of ethics is that it's very collaborative. You have to have input from both scientists and ethicists to co-create or to even use the terminology that biologists like to use to, to co-culture these two approaches at the same time in a way that's uh, uh, mutually reinforcing and mutually influencing. So I'd first uh, propose this type of in-between ethics between traditional bioethics and engineering ethics in a paper that I published in Cell Stem Cell uh, back in, I believe it was 2017. And there the title of it was Engineering Ethics and Self-Organizing Models of Human Development, Both the Opportunities and Challenges. Um, and so let me explain a little bit further what I mean by engineering ethics. What is this new engineering ethics? As I said, traditional engineering ethics had to do with non-living things. Um, but let me expand further though. Traditional engineering ethics seem to be very much focused on the ethical and social implications of new technologies before technology design and formation, just kind of in anticipation of how much the world might change if we unleashed a new technology in uh, social life. So think uh, autonomous driving cars here, right? So people will think before they actually exist, how will society look with autonomous cars and how might that affect industry like trucking and other uh, economies based on human drivers? And then you have another area of engineering ethics, which looks at how to assign blame when things go wrong. So the Challenger explosion or the space shuttle is a very good example of this, right? When things go wrong, how do we assign blame and how do we prevent things like this from happening again? Or when a bridge collapses, the same thing happens. What's missing is that sort of middle portion of the development of the technology, the ethics of the development and design of a new technology. And that's where the new engineering ethics comes in. Now the new engineering ethics in that sense of the ethics of design, the ethics of design engineering and technology development itself, it's really emerged out of the Netherlands. There's been just beautiful, wonderful work in this so-called new engineering ethics coming out of the Netherlands. And I'll just use a simple example to explain some of uh, uh, the, the insights of this approach. Um, for example, the Dutch Evo car was a project where uh, design teams were challenged to come up with a design for a city car for cities like Amsterdam, where uh, you wanted to do two things. You wanted a car that was extremely efficient, but also a car that was extremely safe. Now, design teams, when they were uh, launching into this, this project, realized very quickly that those two goals, efficiency and safety, fight each other a little bit. You can't optimize both goals at once. You have to trade off one for the other at a certain point. The heavier you make the car by making it safer, by adding more safety features, makes it less efficient. To make it more efficient, you have to make it lighter. And so you realize you can't actually maximize both engineering goals at the same time. So you have to make a trade-off decision. And when you make these trade-off decisions, you implicitly depend on values. Some of these values will be ethical values. There'll be values in questions like this. 
what do we mean by safety? Do we mean just the safety of the driver and the passengers? Or do we also mean safety of the pedestrians? Uh, what do we mean by efficiency? Do we also include in that sustainability? So these are deeply social and ethical questions that depend on commitments for ethical values. So what this means is that um, designs are not value neutral by any means. You have to make trade-off decisions informed by value systems. And all too often when engineers work together, these um, what we call covering values for your trade-off decisions are unstated and um, unexposed for uh, rational reflection by the team themselves. So what the Dutch engineers have said was, very plausibly in my opinion, that you have to identify the value judgments that are motivating these various engineering alternatives. You have to also discuss openly how trade-off decisions are to be made. So part of this task will be also to use ethical value considerations to help guide your trade-off decisions, like what does safety mean? What does um, our commitment to efficiency actually amount to? Now, one more insight that I want to draw on from the Dutch is that designs themselves, they mediate people's behaviors and expectations. Designs themselves, they can be ethical or unethical in ways that influence people's behavior. This may sound a little bit strange when I state it in this abstract way, but we can think of plenty of examples in real life. You know that the design of workspaces, the design of people's workspaces will mediate how they interact with one another. The way you design a prison, like the panopticon, proposed by Jeremy Bentham, will also be criticized by some as being unethical in how it influences behavior and how people interact in good ways or bad ways with one another. The way you design a coffee cup to go will mediate or encourage people to take it out on the road. Or if it's not a to-go cup, if it's a ceramic mug, to sit down and have a chat or coffee. It's take your time, like they do in Europe, not like in America at Starbucks, right? So we know, we know from experience in everyday life that designs really do mediate people's behaviors and there are good designs and bad designs that make people do good things or bad things on an unconscious level. Uh, you might even say that laws and policies are things that are designed by people. And clearly people criticize laws and policies for being ethical or unethical. So this is not an unusual idea. I think uh, uh, we recognize this if we just simply reflect on our own experiences. So let me give you some concrete examples of how this collaborative ethics may come into play. Those of you who joined us for Ethical Frontiers in Biotechnology last month with Jingping Fu should know that this is uh, the paper that we discussed in very detail from his lab at the University of Michigan. So what they did here was a microfluidic system where you can uh, feed into the, the bottom of those channels there, human pluripotent stem cells that are then in this microfluidic system coaxed over just four days to form what would be essentially uh, day 10 of human embryo development for study. Um, now, you know, many people will look at this kind of experiment and they'll say, you know, you've created a type of M cell, a type of multicellular engineered living system that, um, you know, uh, could be quite frightening for some people. And so there has to be some understanding of what was the design choices that went into why it looks this way and how it operates and were there any ethical reflections along the way in uh, informing how this M cell was created and designed. And uh, ha happily, the answer is yes, there's been quite a bit of ethical reflection. Uh, in my collaborations with the Food Lab, we have talked about um, making sure that these M cells or these embryo models, um, this particular type of M cell, are actually not complete in the sense that they have all the cell types and cell lineages that are represented in an actual 10-day-old embryo, and therefore are not capable of full human life. So this was actually put into their ethics statement and the methods of their paper that I just uh, showed you the title of. But these sacs, they lack primitive endoderm, they lack tropho uh, trophoblasts, they lacked various parts of a real embryo that would make it capable of creating a pregnancy. Right now, there were trade-off decisions along the way. They could have added all the components and tried to make it 100% as complete and accurate as possible, but they very clearly, very wisely, I think, chose not to make trade-off decisions in that direction and really balance it out in terms of other ethical considerations that were at play. So their design choices were informed by ethical deliberation and collaboration. So I'm going to... Um, pause here and turn it back over to Roger before I talk about moving this field socially forward in a responsible way.
So let me stop this and go ahead, Roger, why don't you share your slides? Okay. Um, let's see, can you see my slides? Not yet. No, not yet. Okay, I don't see now the option to share all of a sudden. I need, I think I need to get out of the show. There we are. Okay. There. How's that? Yes, we got it. Okay. So I started talking about uh, a couple of these examples. I want to go back now to the, um, the, the motor unit on a chip. I remember I was talking about the fact that we're, what we're really reproducing here is sort of the spinal cord uh, with these motor neurons, extending out these neurites that interpenetrate into the muscle over here shown in red. Um, and, and we're now starting to recapitulate uh, some important organ functions in the body. And these cells, by the way, we've engineered so that they're, um, they express something called channel rhodopsin. It's a light activated ion channel that allows us to activate the neurons simply by shining light on them. Those then activate a signal that gets transmitted through the neurites into the muscle, producing a muscle contraction. Now, this is something that recapitulates just uh, human physiology but we can use that now to start looking at disease processes because we can develop functional measures. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that the muscle was, was mounted or grown on these two posts. The posts are flexible so that the deflection of the post can be used as a, a measure of, a, a way to, to um, uh, measure what the force of contraction is. And you can see here, here from the movie, um, the small contractions the small de deformations of the post on each contraction. Now, with this model, we generated these entirely from, from pluripotent cells. So what if we go back now, if we're interested in modeling disease, we can take, for example, um, that are uh, ne neurons that are generated from a healthy subject uh, and also ge generate the same type of model from a, a subject that has um, it's called sporadic um, ALS. In other words, there's no known um, uh, genetic uh, uh, malfunction or uh, mutation in these cells, except that once we tested them, we found out that there was one that, that is common to a lot of ALS patients. But here immediately you can see in the structures that are formed that with the healthy motor unit, these neurites extend into the muscle and they branch within the muscle and they connect up and they form synapses with the individual myotubes in the muscle. And, and with this, you can form normal muscle contractions. With the ALS motor neurons though, what you find is that um, they can still send out neurites. The neurites link up with the muscle, but it's much more random in pattern. So you can immediately see, you know, just visually the difference between the two after, this is now after 14 days of co-culture. So we went one step further and said, well, could we use this as a model for drug screening? So we took, uh, we looked in the literature and found two drugs, um, basudinib and rapamycin, that are currently being tested either in a phase one or a phase two clinical trial uh, for ALS treatment. Uh, they both affect the autophagy the, um, uh, in, in, this, in the cells. So we first of all looked at our functional measures uh, we measured the muscle contraction force. Um, if you look over on day 14, <clears throat> this is the healthy motor unit. This is the ALS motor unit. And then when you we, uh, applied either of the two tre treatments, either singly or in combination, we found that we got some partial recovery of the muscle contractile force, demonstrating that we could actually see a difference due to the drugs and, and also a fairly substantial difference between the healthy and, and the diseased motor unit. Um, we could also look, for example, at cell death. And interestingly here, even though the muscle cells were the same in the two uh, experiments, um, 
when you look at muscle cell death within the muscle, you find that it's very low in the healthy uh, motor unit, uh, quite high in the ALS uh, case. Um, but then when we start to treat with either of the two drugs again, we found that the amount of cell death that we observed, uh, again, after 14 days, was significantly reduced. So we're doing here, it's a dumb, just one example. Uh, there are a lot of others that I could have given, but one example of how you can use these M cells or these, in this case, microphysiological systems as a, a beneficial way of, of screening for drugs for patients either um, with different mutations, for example, corresponding to different diseases. So obviously there are a lot of benefits that one can reap from using these, these systems. Um, there are other systems that are being developed that um, at this point, I, I think it's fair to say they're, they're mostly test beds for understanding the concept, concepts of emergence and how to develop these, um, these M cells. These are walking biobots. These, these are biological robots where muscle cells are, are seated onto, a, um, in this case, a, a flexible substrate. <clears throat> and the muscle cells uh, they coalesce around this so that they can actually generate a, a contractile force. And the substrate is made in such a way that it's, it's asymmetric so that as the muscle contracts, and here these, these muscle cells have been made optogenetic, so every time the light flashes, the, the muscles contract. You, they, they start to move along on the, on, on the floor here. Uh, this is all in medium, um, and, and these are there's obviously no real application for this at this stage, but you can imagine taking this step, you know, a, a step further and starting to make robots that, that could either swim or maybe invade into the tissues of the body and deliver drugs in a certain location. So this work has been going on at, at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with some of our collaborators from, from EDEX. Um, another um, uh, of studies that have been done, in this case by Mike Levin's lab uh, at Tufts University, is to design a, a walking biobot, but to do it through an evolutionary algorithm. And basically what he did is he, he takes cells from a frog embryo and he engineers some so that they're contractile, <coughs> I'm sorry, and some that are not. And he looks to um, evolutionary algorithm, he can combine these in various ways and form different structures and look for designs that wind up being motile. So he generates a design, he can test it computationally, and then once he identifies a design that, that works, that can move around, it can actually uh, meet the design criteria, he can then go in and he can make these from the, from the frog embryo cells that he's engineered. Uh, and here's one example of the structures that, that he's generated. This is now a little, um, it's like a stool that has four legs. <clears throat> and um, these stools, uh, in this particular case, due to the random contractile forces that are generated within the, the, um, uh, this little uh, contraption, whoops, uh, he can generate the system that, that can, um, again, walk around. And he can now optimize the system through his, his algorithm. Now, Mike has been doing a lot of other interesting work looking at um, other cell types when they combine can form motility uh, even independently without any external uh, intervention. So there's some really interesting work going on there. I want to give you one more example. And this is uh, an example from um, Ron Weiss's lab at MIT to generate uh, a 3D liver organoid. Um, and here what he's doing is, one of the main limitations of these organoids is the fact that they grow to a certain size. And here you can see some that have grown up to really a centimeter size. But there, there's a natural limitation to how large they can grow and also a limitation to their functionality if they don't have a, um, uh, the capability of being vascularized. So, for example, a liver can't really, can't really serve its function unless it has a vascular network growing through it. So what, what Ron has done in his lab is that he's engineered some of these cells so that if when he introduces um, uh, GATA6 into the cells, uh, and he can then turn on the GATA6 at some point in time during the differentiation process, during the growth of these organoids, and whether they have high GATA6 or low GATA6, 
that det determines whether they go into either uh, mesoendoderm or ectoderm, and the cells that go into the, the mesoendoderm path can ultimately form into the liver, like what you see on the right-hand side there. The ones that go into ectoderm can ult ultimately form into a brain. So we're starting to gain some ability to control the structure of the organoids and being able to do this even in a temporal manner and turn on certain signaling pathways at a certain point in time. So these liver organoids, the ones that he's uh, induced to actually form vasculature, look something like this inside. And the green, you can see it looks like a, a network structure. The green actually is a marker for endothelial cells. <clears throat> and let's see, there we go. And you can see the networks that are forming. And one of the things that Ron and I are starting to work on together is being able to connect that internal vasculature with an external vasculature that we can then perfuse. Uh, one of the methods that we're using to do that is to generate, uh, in this case, we're using a brain organoid. So we use one of the microfluidic systems of the type that I was showing you before. Here's that central region that I was showing you. And here's a, a this, this would be a brain organoid. And the green lines around the outside are meant to represent uh, vascular structures that we can grow. Now, we've actually started doing this. You can see here the green vascular networks around the outside of here the brain organoid is, is, uh, stain, is uh, expressing a, a red fluorophore. And uh, the fact that the, the blue that's inside the vascular network shows where the network is being perfused. And at this point in time, we can get some of these vascular structures to start to grow into the brain, but you can see that we can't quite perfuse it. <clears throat> but we're getting very close. And I think we're within probably several months now, uh, both our lab and, and other labs around the US and the world, where we will be able to vascularize these organoids. We will be able to grow them to larger structures. And with a vascular uh, a structure and perfusible vasculature inside, we'll be able to control these systems uh, much more uh, finely and, 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 and uh, accurately than we can today. So it raises the prospect that we could now, probably within a relatively short period of time, have brain organoids that are perfused and as, as they're perfused, they can grow to larger structures. We can start to communicate with them. And it raises all sorts of uh, interesting possibilities, but also a lot of interesting questions. And I just want to end by mentioning what some of those questions are that maybe we can discuss and uh, discuss in, in the discussion period later. But we start to ask, at, at what level of complexity does a biological machine become a living organism? And, and, and what actually constitutes life in an M cells? Is it the ability to, to self-repair itself? Certainly these things can already self-repair to some extent. Uh, can they learn? Uh, some of the systems, for example, that Mike Levin's been working on uh, actually show that these systems can, can learn and have, have uh, even a non-neural memory. They can adapt to their, the changes in their environment. Um, and, some of the systems are even getting to the point where you might ask whether they're actually uh, replicating themselves. Um, I just want to end by saying that uh, these are some of the issues, types of issues that we've talked about in our NSF center. Uh, at ebix.net, there are ethics modules that we've generated and where we've discussed some of these ethical issues within the center among the students and faculty and postdocs. And if any of you are interested, you'd be welcome to to go to this website and, uh, and, and see what we have to say. So at this point, um, I will turn things back to Insu. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, so let me just uh, take us down the home stretch here before our uh, Q&A session. And I point your attention to a recent publication that came out of a series of NSF funded workshops around M cells involving the M cells research community. And here we really focus on uh, trying to articulate what it would mean to build a community around responsible research on this type of biological emergence that I spoke of. I'm not going to go through 
the details of this. I just want to give you a few highlights of this article. Um, one of them is that we have to acknowledge that MCEL's research is not just about pursuing abstract scientific knowledge. It's also about creating a technology that's going to have specific societal applications. So this is where the engineering ethics comes in, in the bioengineering uh, ethics discipline I'm trying to build. Now, some of the questions that emerge about um, uh, mem cells has to do with selecting and developing those kinds of societal applications in a way that A, the potential benefits are gonna be fairly distributed, and B, the creations themselves or the knowledge gained through their use does not lead to some biosecurity risks or malevolent uses. For example, maybe some biosecurity risks or malevolent uses of bio robots. Now, just to give you an example of how specific societal applications will really drive the future of many of these M cell technologies. I'm just give you one salient example now. Roger had mentioned organoids, right, as a very important um, M cell type. And an organoid, for example, a lung organoid can be developed through stem cells to mimic the basic organ structure of the lung. Now, lung organoids uh, are going to be used for many studies that try to develop and study um, interventions for the COVID-19 virus, right? Because you can't study in an animal lung exactly what may be going on in the human lung, and you can't study patients themselves in an easily accessible manner as you could with an organoid. So here we have an M cell that could be vastly important for the development of a societal application, namely strategies to combat corona coronaviruses. And, um, and, and so, you know, this presents an enormous opportunity, um, but then there raises the questions of how these benefits that flow out of this type of research should be fairly distributed around in society from, for example, the drugs you might develop through this platform. So we really do need to think about preparing the next generation of researchers, the next generation of researchers, for example, that go through Roger's lab and are trained by Roger and his colleagues in order to help them uh, get ready for what we want, which is collaborative scientific, ethical, and societal deliberation through this uh, co-culture of ethics and science that I had mentioned earlier. So how should we facilitate that kind of inclusive deliberation, not only amongst the co-culture uh, you know, community of the ethicists and the scientists and the engineer, but also with the public and other uh, interested parties that uh, have some kind of a stake in M cells research. So let me just finish with my last main graphic. And there are three different ways to answer the question, how do we bring um, different, uh, points of view and deliberation into the mix. And I'm gonna use an analogy um, that may be familiar for drivers in the United States. Okay, imagine that you have three lanes on a highway all heading toward the advancement of a biotechnology, you have three approaches to doing this. Um, you know, you can either be in the fast lane, which is gonna be basically based on uh, assessing risk and efficacy, and think here uh, of the um, sort of orientation that the FDA takes for technology development, right? You have a source of uncertainty and that source of uncertainty is just the lack of data. We don't know if this drug or we don't know if this biologic will do what it's promised to do. So how do you base your decision-making? You gather more data, you do more experiments. So with more data comes less uncertainty. And what is your policy approach for the go or no-go decision for deployment into society of this technology? It's gonna be based on risk calculation, right? So that's essentially what the FDA is focused on. Now, this is the fast lane, even though you may think the FDA doesn't move fast enough, this is the fast lane for um, advancing a technology. There's also a middle lane though. And actually as a driver in the US, I actually prefer riding in the middle lane. <laughs> for personal reasons, but um, the middle lane is one where you have uncertainty, at, it's always present, right? Uh, sort of like a ineliminable part of new technologies. However, how do you base your decision of reducing uncertainty? You have to use diverse methods, you have to use diverse stakeholder uh, viewpoints, 
including ethicists and engineers. So this is the sort of the collaborative approach I talked about. And the policy approach for the go or no go will be based on um, not knowledge that's not simply just risk benefit analysis, but a more diverse set of um, considerations that might include sociological, you know, um, social justice considerations, access considerations, things like that. So it's much more pluralistic. Um, and then you have the slow lane. Now you definitely know people in the slow lane here because they can't wait to get off the highway. They're looking for the nearest exit off that, off that, uh, uh, that road, right? So what do people say here? They're gonna be the pessimists. So the people in the fast lane are the technological optimists, the people in the slow lane, slow lane are the pessimists. They'll say um, the source of uncertainty here is just the inherent capacity for these new technologies to cause harm. They're all gonna be in some way harmful. How do we go with the go or no go decision? What is the basis for decision making for deployment? It will be controllability. For example, can we control gene drive? If we unleash this in the environment, those of you who know what gene drives are, uh, will know what I'm speaking about here without me having to explain what that is. And then the, um, the, the go or no-go decision for policy will be based on technology selection. So people might say things like this, right? In vitro fertilization, yeah, you know, poses some inherent risks and harms for people. It could be difficult to control how people use this technology. So you know what? Let's get off this highway and let's just encourage adoption. Let's encourage another form or another road to get people uh, to the goal of, let's say, having healthy children that they can love and raise, right? So technology selection. You know, let's not go with gene drive. Let's put our efforts toward um, medicated um, mosquito nets and the deployment of these or to try to you know, do a better job of dealing with standing water in communities. Right, technology selection. Um, I think that uh, for M cells to proceed, I would recommend the middle lane. So don't don't look for off ramps and say we don't need organoids, we don't need embryo models, we don't need the kinds of bio robots that uh, Roger had alluded to. But we need more people involved in the mix and to uh, base our decisions on a more diverse set of knowledge. So I'm going to just end with this. Uh, Last quote in the paper that I alluded to earlier that was published in Biofabrication, what we say here amongst the people who participated in this NSF workshop is that M cells, they actually have, the researchers, they actually have an opportunity here. They have an opportunity to proactively lead a robust ethical conversation, one that goes beyond just the requirements of standard ethical regulations. It goes beyond conventional wisdom that the public should be just simply educated and consulted, but they're actually not co-culturing the development of the field. We, as the authors, maintain that the commitments and the strategies that we propose in our paper, if adopted, could help fulfill the potential and to establish M cells as an ethically responsible community and actually as a model for future emerging techno-scientific fields. So with that, I would really love to hear the questions that you have, and we have half an hour that Roger and I would be happy to field the questions uh, for you. I thank you for joining us in the formal part of the presentation. That's our contact information if you want to follow up in any way. If you want to email me, I'm happy to send you um, PDFs of both articles that I had mentioned, both the cell stem cell paper that I had written a while back about engineering ethics, and then uh, the other group paper that I mentioned from the M-cells community that was published in Biofabrication. So I'm happy to send you these papers if you want to take a look for yourself. And let's turn it over to Q&A. So I'm going to stop my uh, slides here and let's go. Let's hear what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, so I'm going to rely on our, um, our helpers here to read off the questions for us. And uh, that's how we'll, we'll run the Q&A session. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. So thank you, Insu and Roger, for your collaborative talk and showing us how co-culture would work between various stakeholders like scientists, engineers, ethicists, and policymakers. Um, while you all take a few moments to type in your questions in the chat box to either Sarah or I, you'll see us with the co-host label. Um, Sarah has a question to start us off. 
Yeah, so just to begin, um, the creation of M cells raises the question that's common in synthetic biology, emergent behavior, and living systems on whether or not you're creating life. And Dr. Kim, you touched on that um, briefly in your presentation as well. So I'd just like to ask, in your opinion, are you creating life or are you merely just rearranging it? Or how would you even start to address that question? Yeah. That's a great question. I guess I could start with that. Um, my, my own feeling is that um, we are creating new forms of life, I guess. Um, but we're doing that by taking pieces of, of existing living system, uh, existing cells, modifying them in some way, and then reassembling them. So it's um, not that we're creating uh, life so much, but that we're um, uh, creating new life forms, in a sense. And I think as we progress through our research, those, those um, constructs that we generate are going to become more and more complex. And they're going to have greater capabilities. And uh, I think it's, I think the question really comes down to at what level of complexity or what level of capability do we ultimately say, well, this now has not stepped over a barrier, but moved into a new realm where, um, you know, maybe it needs a, a more stringent constraints or considerations. Um, and Sue, do you want, want to comment on that as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, this is an easy question. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, it's, a def it's a very difficult question. Um, so the short answer to the question is, uh, in one sense, yes, we are creating life because it's actually in the term itself, M cells, engineer, multi-cell multi engineered living systems. And there's a sense in which the cells that, uh, that we use, or not we, but people like Roger use to make M cells, they are living cells, right? Cells can die. Your M cell can actually die if you don't culture it properly uh, to people's dismay in the lab. So there is a sense in which they are alive in the cellular sense. But then the, 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 the deeper question I think behind the, the, the question that was posed is um, what do we mean by kind of like morally significant life? Uh, and that's the harder one, right? Um, what do we mean by morally significant life? If anybody looks up, um, definitions that people have proposed for what an organism is. So not, not like a single cell, like a neuron, like a neuron could be alive or dead, but actually an, an organism. Uh, we don't call these M cells organisms, we call them living systems, right? Uh, what is involved in something being an organism? Well, maybe it has to have certain key features that M cells simply lack at this point. Maybe uh, you might build into your definition of an organism has to have the capability of reproduction. It has to have the capability of adaptation or learning. You know, these are, these are high-level abilities that I think at this point, um, I, Roger, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think M cells are nearly at that level yet. So um, I think that the, 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 it's a very interesting question. I think that the better way to frame it is to ask, at what point are we creating an organism? And furthermore, are we creating an organism for which we owe some level of moral respect. Um, people create M cells, I suppose, in the lab all the time in the sense that you might make a transgenic mouse. You have a transgenic mouse uh, that doesn't exist in nature. It's not a natural kind in the fullest sense, but clearly it's alive. It's able to reproduce, it's able to adapt, but people don't think that that is wrong. Um, maybe simply because it's non-human, so obviously if you made a synthetic embryo or embryo model that could be capable of making full human life, people might say you're actually making life there in the moral sense. Um, so it's a, it's a rich question. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because to even ask the question, you have to make some value presuppositions that uh, people may or may not share as kind of a background assumption to that question. So thank you for that question. It is a good, tough one to start us off with. What are some other questions? Okay, next we have um, from Angela Alberti of Harvard Medical School. Uh, to either of you, how is ownership or the patenting process of these technologies being determined? If these systems are able to create much needed organs, who gets to own these techniques? And should one entity be allowed to own them? 
Ooh, another good one. I'm going to send it over to Roger because, you know, Roger, when you make M cells, you must obviously have to deal with uh, this question about who owns this thing, right? Because you use donors. Absolutely. Cells. Yeah. So please give us the, give us yeah. your experience with this. Yeah. So for example, I mean, the, um, the, the model that we have of the motor unit is something that uh, there we submitted, we prepared and submitted a patent application for. Um, so it's a living system. But it's a, um, I guess the patent is more on, on the, 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 the device that we use to generate the system inside, uh, the procedures that we use in order to generate the, 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 first of all, differentiate the different cell types and then get them to interact with one another. Um, so maybe it's not that we're actually patenting the, 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 the organism or the, the living system itself, but more the process to, to make it. Um, I think as the systems become more complex, I think the, the kinds of question you're, you're asking probably gonna become more and more difficult to answer. But right now I'd say that by and large, um, these systems are being handled in, in a fairly routine way and dealt with as, a, as, they, as any kind of an abiotic invention would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Angela, that was a fantastic question as well. And let me also give you um, a bioethicist response, um, actually much further up in the causal chain of M cells research. Um, so IPS cells are cells that you create by taking a patient somatic cell sample like uh, skin cells or um, cells that you might find in peripheral blood. And you reprogram in the lab to take on stem cell like properties of like, let's say a human embryonic stem cell that can create all kinds of different cell types. And this is a, a, like the building block of M cells, human, human M cells, right? Um, who owns those IPS cells? Uh, already, it's, it's been pretty well established internationally that it's going to be the research team that's derived the IPS cells from your skin sample, for example, right? So your skin sample has your genetics, and so does that IPS cell line. But that question of who owns that thing has already been settled at the very first step of IPS cell derivation. And then when people uh, further improve upon nature by mixing their labor with it, I'm going to echo John Locke here. If you mix your labor with some raw material, make it better, so skin cell to stem cell, then it becomes morally, according to this view, yours. It becomes your property. Now imagine taking IPS cells and making them even more complicated and bioengineered down the road to something like an M cell. Okay, so kind of in the, in the moral, political, philosophical uh, response to the question, I think that question has really been settled in a controversial way, because not everybody agrees with this, way, 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 way back when the donor provided cells to a research team to make IPS cells, right? So I can't imagine that down that chain of development, we're gonna suddenly roll all that back and give ownership back to the original cell donor, even though there are some people who would argue that that original cell donor has some kind of reach through rights to the use and direction of how their cell line is, is, is manipulated by other researchers. And some might even argue that they have a reach through right for royalties on commercial value. But that's a, that's a minority view, I think, in uh, bioethics, although a very, very compelling, interesting one to, con to contemplate. But that question of ownership, I would even say it's kind of been quote unquote settled, at least in the US courts, way back in IPS cell derivation, which are the building blocks for M cells. Okay, great. If there are no other comments about that question, um, I'll start with the next one. So regarding ethics, should there be limits on the extent to which biomachines are engineered so that the organoid um, or the organism organoid does not stand up and demand that it has legal rights or the right to vote? Um, should vocal organoids be developed and engineered so it speaks independently without any language programming at the level of a third grader? Okay, well, I'll, to be fair, I'll jump on that one first. <laughs> so that's, 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 a, that's a good question. Um, people who attended an earlier Ethical Frontiers talk that I did with George Church uh, should recall what I said back then about the concept of minimal personhood. So let, let, let me, let me um, revive that concept for you here now. 
Um, so the question seems to uh, really push on the possibility that we could get to a point with some of these more complex multicellular systems to have um, at least maybe not the M cell speaking up for herself, like, like the question proposed, but maybe people speaking on behalf of the uh, M cell's interest to say, is there something here now that deserves our moral forbearance and respect in the way that you would also grant that to an organism that had some capacity for moral status, whether it's sentience or the ability to feel pain or the ability to communicate or interact with this environment, right? So um, I propose that a good way maybe to think about the limits of M cells research or other kinds of bioengineering systems research is to ask hypothetically, is there a concept of minimal personhood that could be useful here? By minimal personhood, we might mean something like philosophically, what are absolutely the minimal standards that need to be present for something in the dish to be considered a person in the moral sense? I don't mean like a human being, but, but, but a person in, in the moral sense or even the legal sense. Uh, uh, quite a lot has to probably happen to get to that point. Now, I'm not going to belabor like what I said back in, I think it was December in that Ethical Frontiers lecture, but, but um, here's where the collaborative design and ethics comes into play, what I call bioengineering ethics. Because if we had an idea of where that threshold was, where we would really start to question whether or not you've created some kind of artificial person. And by the way, this comes up in artificial intelligence and it can come up with non-living matter engineering like computer engineering, okay? So we're not just talking about M cells here. But if we have an idea of where that threshold is, is just above, or we're kind of getting to that point where we're wondering, is there, what's in the dish? What is that? Is that a person? Is that something with rights? If we had an agreed upon idea of where that was, it would be very useful for research teams then to know where to back off. Like, you know, like you're getting into the red zone when you're getting up to that level. Um, so I think there's kind of some interesting work ahead of us where we could talk with both engineers, bioengineers, scientists, and philosophers to kind of deliberate about in the real world of the lab, where would that line be? And how would we know that we're approaching it? And just to kind of like think this through in advance, it's almost like, you know, not quite pandemic planning, but something kind of like that, you know, something to kind of like get ready and know where, where the line is and then just back off it or, or, or just don't get up to that point. Um, so I think really what the question is asking is at what point does an M cell become a person and have rights? And uh, that's something worth thinking about in advance. And we need this collaborative effort to kind of define the boundaries of the research and just ensure that we don't flirt too close to that line, but still leave plenty of room for innovation and biotechnology growth and benefit for society. So I hope I've done something to address that question. And Roger, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, just a kind of a different aspect of the question. You, it was, was asked in the context of, you know, could this living system at some point uh, verbalize a, um, and, and express itself? And, and I don't think you have to go that far for it to be a, you know, a living system because we have ways of interrogating these, these uh, organoids. We can uh, introduce signals to it. We can look at the way it's responding. We can get feedback from it. So in a sense, that system is already communicating with us. It's responding in some way that, that we can, uh, in, at some level, understand. And it doesn't have to be verbally. Uh, it can be through um, a, a certain pattern of, of, of neurons being activated or um, a, a certain growth pattern or, or some, some kind of feedback that we can get. And I think as we, I think probably in, in the much nearer term, will be a situation where we can start to develop these, these organoids and, and probably the brain is the best example, but then we can start to communicate with it. We can stimulate it in certain ways and we can then observe uh, through a number of different sensing mechanisms, we can observe its response to our stimulus. And that's, even at that point, I think the, the, the question becomes relevant. Yeah, I, I, was, I was informed that uh, we have a lot of questions pouring in, so we're going to have to try to keep our answers much shorter. I would love to just be able to just have, have a fireside chat and just share a beer with everybody and just talk about this for hours, but we don't have that kind of time. So let's cycle through these a little bit faster. We'll try to keep our responses brief, but still, I hope, fulfilling in some way. So let's go with the next question. Okay, an audience member asked, 
Would it be wrong to consider this technology as a sort of prosthetic device instead of a living mechanism? Interesting. Um, Raja, what do you think? I mean, what, yeah. Well, they certainly could become prosthetic devices. I can imagine a living system being developed in order to um, assist somebody who has um, some disabilities. Um, but they, they wouldn't necessarily all have to be that, at least in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger, can you just touch on what, once in conversation, you and I talked about hyper organs or, or like hyper organ noise or things like that. I mean, that might be a kind of prosthetic, right? I mean, it's kind of, it kind of gets in that direction. Yeah, so a hyper organ would be an organ that maybe performs um, the same function that say a liver or kidney does, but does it more efficiently, or maybe a heart patch that has that can more effectively pump than our current muscle cells. So that I think that those are assist devices, um, and there's certainly you know hyper organs is is a nice term that we we've, we've been using to describe these systems, but that's an interesting application. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I would say it's actually not an either or. You could actually have something that's an M cell and a prosthetic. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. Next question. Okay, great. So the next question is, how is research of M cells in the private sector different from research of M cells in academia? How can we ensure that this discussion of bioethics is maintained in both academia and the private sector? Mm, that's a great question. Roger, what are the differences <laughs> in, in the two spheres? Oh, gee, that is a tough question. Um, we, we do a lot of work with, um, you know, the pharma or biotech companies. And um, I don't see many differences between the way in which we address these questions. In fact, some of the people that we've engaged in conversations are people from, you know, companies in, in, in the local uh, biotech industry. Uh, and they have much the same views. And I think uh, the same responses to questions like that that we do. Yeah, yeah, and I would just briefly add to that that I have done some work with you know um, biotech companies around ethics, and and I think we need to be a little bit careful of not casting it as sort of like a like a dichotomy between academic research that's going to be kind of a little bit more ethically tuned and open and, and, and responsive, and then sort of like you know evil private industry. I think that there are plenty of people in industry who are very very sensitive to ethical issues, and in fact, it's a good business model to sort of make sure that your your practices and the products you you deliver are developed in an ethical manner. Because if people find out that something went badly ethically in the course of research, it's not gonna look good for um, the product that you wanna sell later. So I, I also kinda wanna push a little bit back on the assumption that maybe academic research is a little bit ethically uh, cleaner than uh, industry. Good question. Next question. Okay, I, oh, you got it, Linda. Yes, I do, sorry for that. Okay. Um, so, an audience member says that M cells development will likely have a significant impact on the number and nature of procedures to which sentient animals in laboratories will be subject in future decades. Do these lab animals deserve to be considered stakeholders in this developmental process from Zeke Benjurin of Harvard Medical School? Okay. Well, that's that's a that's a question I'm sure many people have on their minds because uh, animal research is a highly sensitive issue for 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 good reason. Um, my answer to that is actually that I know of um, many M cells researchers who want to be able to offer their M cells platforms as an alternative to animal research. So, um, if done well. And if it actually does uh, recapitulate some human organ systems, let's say, you know, uh, organoids, um, for example, will be one, one approach. Then you have an experimental system that's all human and uh, could be highly controllable, scalable. Um, you can do a lot of drug screening on your organoids, which if you design them in the right way are not gonna have human rights or they're not gonna be so complex that you start to wonder whether you've created an organism, but you definitely have a little miniature organ model. Um, I would suspect that actually the advancement of this field will uh, help ease the need for uh, animal research. Um, Roger, what do you think? I, that's exactly what I was going to say. I, I think if anything, it'll lead to a reduction in, in animal experiments. And I think that's 
in some respects, the motivation that a lot of us have, that we would like to see a reduction in animal use and drug screening. And this is a good way to do it. Right. So if you imagine that middle lane that I pointed out, and you have many different people weighing in on the co-culture of the ethics of this field, you can imagine there's a space there for people who are very concerned about animal use and research. I, I would imagine that they'd be a very important collaborator in moving the field forward. Mm -hmm. Next question. Okay, great. So we may have commented on this a bit, but um, I'll just read the question. It seems like personhood is most closely connected to subjective experience, which is emergent from advanced nervous systems. Is the concept of being alive overemphasized with respect to moral status? Mm -hmm. um, so good question. I, I, um, So yeah, the, the persons, whoever asked that is correct. I mean, it, it personhood is really kind of more associated with these complex um, capabilities that you're not gonna see in M cells. And maybe we're being a little bit confused by uh, focusing too much on the human cell aspect of these things. Um, I, I think I tend to agree with what the person said. I mean, that's why I don't really worry much about personhood emerging, you know, as one of the emergent things that could happen because we mean something so much richer than like biological organization when we, when we talk about personhood. The one thing I will point out that is an area for further debate philosophically is that whether um, something could enter into the, the uh, status of personhood simply on the basis of having the future potential to have these more complex capabilities. So that's what people say about embryos in the dish, in the fertility clinic. These things don't have any, any of the biological substrates yet for consciousness, right? But they'll say they have the ability in the, in the bright con conditions and the potential to do so. So that potentiality argument, if it works there for the human embryo that's not yet fully formed, might be applied for M-cells if somebody believes that under the right conditions that M-cell could further emerge and develop into something much more complicated. So I think that the potentiality argument is actually something that could, could be a factor here though. That's not something I personally actually am enamored with. I'm not all that convinced philosophically with the potentiality argument for personhood. I think there's some mistakes being made there philosophically, but, uh, but I can imagine people definitely applying that potentiality argument to, to M cells. So I don't want to cast that aside completely, but, um, but um, um, yeah, I, I think that we're far away from that right now with M cells. Roger. Yeah, I, I agree that I think that's, that's quite a bit off in the future, but at the same time, you know, these are things that we need to discuss earlier rather than later, you know, when, um, you know, when we've actually formed an M cells that, that, you know, has a personality, has, has certain uh, features and characteristics. I think now is the time for us to have a discussion. So I, you know, I, I think it's a good question. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Here's another question by Anonymous. If successful, how accessible would this technology be for developing nations? Are there any concerns regarding medical access and economic gaps among nations? Related to this is a second question that are we only focusing on quote unquote Western diseases with this technology? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. If I asked the question in tonight's session as an audience member, that would be the question I would ask. Uh, excellent question. Um, if I must say so myself. Um, so this is a topic that actually I talked with Roger in the past and his colleagues at MIT. And the challenge I posed was imagine this collaborative ethical approach between the ethicists, engineers, you might have other, other people involved, you know, citizens. Uh, and the challenge is this, right? We can make M cells do many different things. I mean, there's the whole engineering aspect of it. You can design M cells in many different ways. I'm only constrained by the actual biological properties and constraints of nature itself. But aside from that, so many things are wide open. What if this is an engineering goal? Because remember, uh, engineering always has some kind of goals to us meet. What if we say, how can M cells improve the lives of people in resource poor communities? How can, M, how can we design from the very beginning an M cell that's going to be beneficial to people who are the worst off and who are the least advantaged? If that is gonna be your solution space that you, you've sort of constructed under which now you're free to play and come up with uh, better or worse solutions, I think that's an enormously uh, useful and, and, and I think uh, admirable 
goal to start off with. So I don't see anything incompatible with MSOL's research and exactly the kind of concerns that the anonymous uh, questioner had just raised, because that would be something that I would want to probe and investigate and, and motivate MSOL's researchers to take in their design phase very early on. Uh, Roger, what do you think about this? Yeah, so I guess in so you're, what you're saying is that it really depends on what the motivation is of the researcher. And whether that, that motivation is to develop technologies for the developing world, or is it for developing technologies that can, you know, hyper organs, for example, where somebody could develop a retina, a retinal implant that can see in the infrared. And that this would only be, I mean, it doesn't cure any disease, but it is sort of a, a, an enhancement that somebody, if they had enough money, they could they could have that surgery and, and they could, could they could have that capability. So it, two different, very different approaches, um, and I think it really depends on what your end target is as to which you know whether it's going to be beneficial to uh, the developing world and and to those less fortunate, or whether it's only going to be available to those that have the money and, and can afford it. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember sitting, Roger, with you in some of these M-cell scientific meetings, and we had presenters talk about, like, you know, these biofilms that are multicellular that could be, like, used to detect toxins in an environment or in yeah. water. So mm -hmm. you can imagine this kind of enormous public health uh, uses in resource-poor countries. If you can make it available and uh, scalable and affordable for people to deploy in those contexts, right? So engineers, uh, you know, let your imaginations run free through uh, a social justice framework. And I think you, you might have some really interesting solutions for uh, some of these problems. Yeah. Um, I believe we are now just at the end. So I just wanna spend this last minute thanking everybody for joining us on Ethical Frontiers. We're gonna have our next event um, May 7th, uh, 5 p.m. And that will be on the issue of brain organoids with Paula Arlotta from Harvard University. She and I will talk us through more specifically the ethical issues that are raised one very exciting type of M cell, which are uh, brain organoids. So please join us for that. Look for that uh, advertisement and, and, and it'll be through Zoom just like this. And I hope you enjoyed it today. I really enjoyed presenting uh, my ideas uh, for you. And Roger, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I just would like to thank the audience. I mean, it's, it's a little strange presenting this way, but uh, I thought the questions that came up were great. They were, um, a lot of the same questions that, that I would be asking. So I uh, very much enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for everybody's attention and attendance. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah and Linda, for fielding those questions. They are my graduate students at Harvard Medical School, and I'm, I'm so proud of the, uh, the work that they've been putting into this and uh, into the uh, program itself. Um, so I'm going to say goodnight from here, and uh, I hope to see you all, or not actually see you, but maybe speak with you <laughs> over Zoom on May 7th. Okay, have a good night, everybody. Thank you.